Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the hundred and sixty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious the king, that after the slave girl had addressed the jeweler, Wait here till I come back to thee. She went away and presently returned with the money which she put, continued the jeweler, into my hand, saying, O my master, in what place shall we meet? Quoth I, I will start and go to my house at once, and suffer hard things for thy sake, and contrive how thou mayest win access to him, for such access is difficult at this present. Said she, Let me know some spot where I shall come to thee. And I answered, In my other house. I will thither go forthright, and have the doors mended, and place made safe again, and henceforth we will meet there. Then she took leave of me, and went her way, whilst I carried the money home, and counting it, found it five thousand dinars. So I gave my people some of it, and to all who had lent me aught I made good their loss, after which I rose and took my servants, and repaired to my other house, whence the things had been stolen, and I brought builders and carpenters and masons who restored it to its former state. Moreover, I placed my negress slave there, and forgot the mishaps which had befallen me. Then I fared forth and repaired to Ali bin Bakar's house, and when I reached it his slave servants accosted me, saying, Our Lord calleth for thee night and day, and hath promised to free whichever of us bringeth thee to him. So they have been wandering about in quest of thee everywhere, but knew not where to find them. Our master is by way of recovering strength, but at times he reviveth, and at times he relapseth. And whenever he reviveth, he nameth thee, and saith, Needs must ye bring him to me, though but for the twinkling of an eye, and then he sinketh back into his torpor. Accordingly, continued the jeweler, I accompanied the slave, and went into Ali bin Bakar, and finding him unable to speak, sat down at his head, whereupon he opened his eyes, and seeing me, wept, and said, Welcome and welcome. I raised him, and making him sit up, strained him to my bosom, and he said, No, O my brother, that from the hour I took to my bed, I have not sat up till now. Praise be to Allah that I see thee again. And I ceased not to prop him and support him until I made him stand on his feet and walk a few steps, after which I changed his clothes and he drank some wine. But all this he did for my satisfaction." Then, seeing him somewhat restored, I told him what had befallen me with the slave girl, none else hearing me, and said to him, Take heart, and be of good courage. I know what thou sufferest. He smiled, and I added, Verily, nothing shall betide thee, save what shall rejoice thee and medicine thee. Thereupon he called for food, which being brought, he signed to his pages, and they withdrew. Then quoth he to me, O my brother, Hast thou seen what hath befallen me? And he made excuses to me, and asked how I had fared all that while. I told him everything that had befallen me, from beginning to end. Whereat he wondered, and calling his servant, said, Bring me such and such things. They brought in fine carpets and hangings, and besides that vessels of gold and silver, more than I had lost, and he gave them all to me. So I sent them to my house, and abode with him that night. When the day began to yellow, he said to me, Know that thou, as to all things, there is an end. So the end of love is either death or accomplishment of desire. I am nearer unto death. Would I had died ere this befell, and had not Allah favored us. We had been found out and put to shame. And now I know not what shall deliver me from this my strait. And were it not that I fear Allah, I would hasten my own death. For know, O brother, that I am like a bird in a cage, and that my life is of a surety, perish, choked by the distresses which have befallen me. Yet hath it a period established firm in an appointment term. And he wept and groaned and began repeating, Enough of tears hath shed the lover white, when grief outcast all patience from his sprite. He hid the secrets which united us, but now his eyes part what he did unite. When he had finished his verses, the jeweler said to him, O oh my lord, I now intend returning to my house. He answered, There be no harm in that. 
Go and come back to me with news as fast as possible, for thou seest my case. So I took leave of him, continued the jeweler, and went home, and hardly had I sat down when up came the damsel, choked with long weeping. I asked, What is the matter? And she answered, Oh, my lord, know then that when we feared hath befallen us. For when I left thee yesterday and returned to my lady, I found her in a fury with one of her two maids who were with her us that other night, and she ordered her to be beaten. The girl was frightened and ran away, but as she was leaving the house, one of the door porters and guards of the gate came up to meet her and took her up and would have sent her back to her mistress. However, she let fall some hints which were a disclosure to him, so he cajoled her and led her on to talk, and she tattled about our case and let him know of all our doings. This affair came to the ears of the caliph, who bade remove my mistress Shams al-Nahar and all her gear to the palace of the caliphate, and set over her a guard of twenty eunuchs. Since then to the present hour he hath not visited her, nor hath given her to know the reason of his action, but I suspect this to be the case. Wherefore I am in fear of my life, and I am sore troubled. O my lord, knowing not what I shall do, nor with what contrivance I shall order my affair and hers, for she has none by her more trusted or more trustworthy than myself. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the hundred and sixty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the slave girl thus addressed the jeweler, and in very sooth my lady hath none by her more trusted or more trustworthy in matter of secrecy than myself. So go thou, O my master, and speed thee without delay to Ali bin Bakar, and acquaint him with this, that he may be on his guard and ward, and if the affair be discovered, we will cast about for some means whereby to save our, save our lives. On this, continued the jeweler, I was seized with sore trouble, and the world grew dark in my sight for the slave girl's words. And when she was about to wind, I said to her, What reckest thou, and what is to be done? Quoth she, My counsel is that thou hasten to Ali bin Bakar, if thou be indeed his friend, and desire to save him. Thine be it to carry him this news at once without aught of stay and delay or regard for far and near, and mine be it to sniff about for further news. Then she took her leave of me and went away, so I rose and followed her track, and betaking myself to Ali bin Bakar, found him flattering himself with impossible expectations. When he saw me returning to him so soon, he said, I see that thou hast come back to me forthright, and only too soon. I answered, Patience, and cut short this foolish connection, and shake off the preoccupation wherein thou art, for there hath befallen that which may bring about the loss of thy life and good. Now when he heard this, he was troubled and strongly moved, and he said to me, O my brother, tell me what hath happened. Replied I, O my lord, know that such and such things have happened, and thou art lost without recourse. If thou abide in this house till the end of the day. At this he was confounded, and his soul well nigh departed his body, but he recovered himself, and he said to me, What shall I do, O my brother, and what counsel hast thou to offer? Answered I, My advice is that thou take what thou canst of thy property, and of whom thy slaves thou trusted, and flee with us to a land other than this, ere this very day come to an end. And he said, I hear and I obey. So he rose, confused and dazed like one in epilepsy, now walking and now falling, and took what came under his hand. Then he made an excuse to his household and gave them his last injunctions, after which he loaded three camels and mounted his beast, and I did likewise. We went forth privily in disguise and fared on and ceased not our warfare the rest of that day and all its night till nigh upon morning when we unloaded and hobbling our camels, lay down to sleep. But we were worn with fatigue, and we neglected to keep watch, so that there fell upon us robbers, and stripped us of 
all that we had and slew our slaves when these would have beaten them off, leaving us naked and in the sorriest of plights after they had taken our money and lifted our beasts and disappeared. <laughs> as soon as they were gone, we arose and walked on till morning dawned when we came to a village which we entered and finding a mosque, took refuge therein, for we were naked. So we sat in a corner all that day, and we passed the next night without meat or drink, and at daybreak we prayed our dawn prayer, and we sat down again. Presently, behold, a man entered, and saluting us, prayed a two-bow prayer, after which he turned to us and said, O folk, are ye strangers? We replied, Yes. The bandits waylaid us and stripped us naked, and we came to this town, but know none here with whom we can shelter. Quoth he, What say ye? Will you come home with me? And pursued the jeweler. I said to Ali bin Bakar, Up, and let us go with him, and we shall escape two evils. The first are fear, lest some one who knoweth us enter the mosque and recognize us, so that we come to disgrace. And the second, that we are strangers, and have no place wherein to lodge. And he answered helplessly, As thou wilt. Then the man said to us again, O oh, ye poor folk, give ear unto me, and come with me to my place. And I replied, Hearkening and obedience. Whereupon he pulled off a part of his own clothes, and covered us therewith, and made his excuses to us, and spoke kindly to us. Then we arose, and accompanied him to his house, and he knocked at the door, whereupon a little slave boy came out and opened it to us. The host entered, and we followed him. When he called for a bundle of clothes and muslins for turbans, and gave us each a suit and a piece, so we dressed and turbaned ourselves and sat us down. Presently in came a damsel with a tray of food, and set it before us, saying, Eat. We ate some small matter, and she took away the tray, after which we abode with our host till nightfall. When Ali bin Bakar sighed and said to me, No, O oh my brother, that I am a dying man, past hope of life, and I would charge thee with a charge. It is that when thou seest me dead, thou goest to my parent, and tell her of my decease, and bid her come hither, that she may be here to receive the visits of condolence, and be present at the washing of my corpse. And do thou exhort her to bear me loss with patience. Then he fell down in a fainting fit, and when he recovered, he heard a damsel singing afar and making verses as she sang. Thereupon he addressed himself to give ear to her and hearken to her voice. And now he was insensible, absent from the world. And now he came to himself, and anon he wept for grief and mourning at the love which had befallen him. Presently he heard the damsel who was singing repeat these couplets. Parting ran up to the part from lover twain, free converse, perfect concord, friendship vain. The nights with shifting drifted us apart. Would heaven I wot if we shall meet again? How bitter after meeting tis to part. May lovers ne'er endure so bitter pain. Death grip, death choke, last for an hour and ends but parting tortures i in heart remain could we but trace where parting's house is placed we would make parting eek of parting taste when ali son of bakar heard the damsel's song he sobbed one sob and his soul quitted his body as soon as I saw that he was dead, continued the jeweler, I committed his corpse to the care of the housemaster and said to him, Know thou that I am going to Baghdad to tell his mother and kinsfolk that they may come hither and conduct his burial. So I betook myself to Baghdad and going to my house changed my clothes, after which I repaired to Ali bin Bakar's lodging. Now when his servants saw me, they came to me and questioned me of him, and I bade them ask permission for me to go in to his mother. They gave me leave, so I entered and saluting her said, Verily, Allah ordered the lives of all creatures by his commandment, and when he decreed aught, there is no escaping its fulfillment. 
nor can any soul depart but by leave of Allah according to the writ which affirmeth the appointed term. She guessed by these words that her son was dead and wept with sore weeping. Then she said to me, Allah upon thee, tell me, is my son dead? I could not answer her for tears and excess of grief. And when she saw me thus, she was choked with weeping and fell to the ground in a fit. As soon as she came to herself, she said to me, tell me how it was with my son. I replied, may Allah abundantly compensate thee for his loss. And I told her all that had befallen him from beginning to end. She then asked, did he give thee any charge? And I answered, yes, and told her what he had said, adding, hasten to perform his funeral. When she heard these words, she swooned away again, and when she recovered, she addressed herself to do as charged by me. Then I returned to my house, and as I went about musing sadly upon the fair gifts of his youth, behold, a woman caught hold of my hand, and Shaharazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the hundred and sixty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the jeweler thus continued. A woman caught hold of my hand, and I looked at her, and lo, it was the slave girl who used to come from Shams al-Nahar, and she seemed broken by grief. When we knew each other, we both wept and ceased not weeping till we reached my house, and I said to her, Knowest thou the news of the youth Ali bin Bakar? She replied, No, by Allah. So I told her the manner of his death and all that had passed while we both wept. After which, quoth I to her, How is it with thy mistress? Quoth she, The commander of the faithful would not hear a single word against her, but for the great love he bore her, saw all her actions in a favorable light and said to her, O oh, Shams al-Nahar, thou art dear to me, and I will bear with thee and bring the noses of thy foes to the grindstone. Then he bade them furnish her an apartment, decorated with gold in a handsome sleeping chamber, and she abode with him in all ease of life and high favor. Now it came to pass that one day, as he sat at wine according to his custom, with his favorite concubines and presents, he bade them to be seated in their several ranks, and made Shams al-Nahar sit by his side. But her patience had failed, and her disorder had redoubled her. Then he bade one of the damsels sing. So she took a lute, and tuning it, struck the chords, and began to sing these verses. One craved my love, and I gave all he craved of me, and tears on cheek betray how twas I came to yield. Teardrops, me seemeth, are familiar with our case, Revealing what I hid, hiding what I revealed. How can I hope in secret to conceal my love? Which stress of passion ever showed unconcealed? Death, since I lost my lover, is grown sweet to me. Would I knew what their joys when I shall quit the field. Now, when Shams al-Nahar heard these verses sung by the slave girl, she could not keep her seat, but fell down in a fainting fit, whereupon the caliph cast the customer on his hand and drew him to her, crying out, and the damsels also cried out, and the prince of the true believers turned her over and shook her, and lo and behold, she was dead. The caliph grieved over her death with sore grief, and bade break all the vessels and dulcimers and other instruments of mirth and music which were in the room. Then carrying her body to his closet, he abode with her the rest of the night. When the day broke, he laid her out, and commanded to wash her and shroud her and bury her. And he mourned for her with sore mourning and questioned not of her case, nor of what caused her condition. And I beg thee in Allah's name, continued the damsel, to let me know the day of the coming of Ali bin Bakar's funeral procession, that I 
may be present at his burial. Quoth I, For myself, where thou wilt, thou canst find me. But thou, where art thou be found? And who can comes to thee where thou art? She replied, On the day of Shams al Nahar's death, the commander of the faithful freed all her women, myself among the rest, and I am one of those now abiding at the tomb in such a place. So I arose and accompanied her to the burial ground and piously visited Shams al Nahar's tomb, after which I went my way and ceased not to await the coming of Ali bin Bakar's funeral. When it arrived, the people of Baghdad went forth to meet it, and I went forth with them. And I saw the damsel among the women, and she was the loudest of them in lamentation, crying out and wailing with a voice that rent the vitals and made the heart ache. Never was seen in Baghdad a finer funeral than his. And we ceased not to follow in crowds till we reached the cemetery and buried him to the mercy of Almighty Allah. Nor from that time to this have I ceased to visit the tombs of Ali, son of Bakar, and of Shams al-Nahar. This, then, is their story. And Allah Almighty have mercy upon them. And yet is not their tale, continued Shahrazad, more wonderful than that of King Sharaman? The king asked her. And what was his tale? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted stay. Now, when it was the hundred and seventieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, as to regards the tale of Kamar al-Zaman, that there was in times of yore and ages long ago before a king called Shahraman, who was the lord of many troops and guards and officers, and who reigned over certain islands known as Calidian Islands, on the borders of the land of the Persians. But he was stricken in years, and his bones were wasted, without having been blessed with a son, albeit he had four wives, daughters of kings, and threescore concubines, with each of whom he wont to lie one night in turn. This preyed upon his mind and disquieted him, so that he complained thereof to one of his wazirs, saying, Verily, I fear lest my kingdom be lost when I die, for that I have no son to succeed me. The minister answered, O king, peradventure Allah shall yet bring something to pass. So rely upon the Almighty and be instant in prayer. It is also my counsel that thou spread a banquet and invite to it the poor and needy and let them eat of thy food and supplicate the Lord to vouchsafe thee a son. For perchance there may be among thy guests a righteous soul whose prayers find acceptance, and thereby thou shalt win thy wish. So the king rose, made the lesser abulation, and prayed a two-bow prayer. And he cried upon Allah with pure intention, after which he called his chief wife to bed and lay with her forthright. By grace of God she conceived, and when her months were accomplished, she bore a male child, like the moon on the night of fullness. The king named him Kamar al-Zaman, and rejoiced in him with extreme joy, and bade the city to be dressed out in his honor. So they decorated the streets seven days whilst the drums beat, and the messengers bore the glad tidings abroad. Then wet and dry nurses were provided for the boy, and he was reared in splendor and delight until he reached the age of fifteen. He grew up of surpassing beauty and seemly head and symmetry, and his father loved him so dear that he could not brook to be parted from him day or night. One day he complained to a certain of his ministers, and at the excess of his love for his only child, saying, O oh, thou wazir, of a truth, I fear for my son Kamar al-Zaman, the shifts and accidents which befall man and fain when I marry him in my lifetime. Answer the wazir, O king, know thou that marriage is one of the most honorable of moral actions, and thou wouldest indeed do well and right to marry thy son in thy lifetime, ere make him sultan. On this quoth the king, 
hither with my son Zamar al Zaman. So he came and bowed his head to the ground in modesty before his sire. O Kamar al Zaman, said King Sharaman, of a truth, I desire to marry thee and rejoice in thee during my lifetime, replied he. O my father, Know that I have no lust to marry, nor doth my soul incline to women. For that, concentrating their craft and perfidy, I have read many books and heard much talk, even as saith the poet. Now, and a woman ask ye, I reply, in their affairs I am first a doctor rare. When a man's head grizzles and his money dwindles, in their affections he hath not for share. And another said, Rebel against women, and so shalt thou serve the Allah all the more. The youth who gives women the rein must forfeit all hope to soar. They'll balk him when seeking the strange device, Excelsior. Thou waste he a thousand of years in the study of science and lore. And when he handed his verses, he continued, O oh, my father, wedlock is a thing whereto I will never consent. Nope. Not though I drink the cup of death. When Sultan Sharaman heard these words from his son, light became darkness in his sight, and he grieved thereout with great grief. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. And so do I cease my telling of these tales for today, until it be morrow.